So I think environmental law has changed quite a lot over the last 40 years. When it first began around 1970, it was very much what we call command and control. Command being, uh, you, must, you, the polluter, must not do something. The control being, if you do, it uh, will punish you. Um, and that worked relatively well uh, with what I'd call first-generation environmental problems. Um, there were point source polluters, meaning large polluters. They were easily identifiable. It was easy to see whether they'd committed a breach of the law or not, uh, and one could threaten to withdraw their license. So uh, as the years have gone by, I think we've seen much more sophistication in, in the sort of approaches that uh, regulators and policymakers have, have used. Policymakers have also become more sophisticated in, in harnessing third parties to be part of the regulatory effort. So sometimes uh, they'll try and get uh, industry to regulate itself, but with a backdrop, uh, an underpinning of government regulation uh, that's necessary uh, to make self-regulation work. So it's better called co-regulation. Uh, but they've also um, empowered third parties such as uh, non-governmental organizations. So my best example would be the toxic release inventory in the United States. Simply required uh, industry to estimate and disclose their level of uh, emissions of hazardous substances. That one on the regulator's database. The NGOs interrogated the database. It would then appear as a league table on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and that um, stigmatized polluters. Uh, the worst polluters didn't look good. Their share price dropped, at least in the short term. Uh, and so it was quite an imaginative uh, use of regulation. In Australia, we have uh, a very large land mass, uh, multiple problems of natural resource management, complex, very difficult to deal with centrally from Canberra. And the level at which to approach those problems is not necessarily the political boundaries. Really, we should think about the ecological boundaries, uh, watersheds, for example. And that's actually what governments did. Um, they developed uh, an approach to natural resource management where they divided Australia into 56 uh, really effectively eco-regions, uh, and they said to each of those regions, um, you develop, um, with all the stakeholders involved, including indigenous groups, environmental groups, local communities, state governments, you develop uh, your own regional environmental plans, uh, and you develop a budget for it. Uh, we, the federal regulators, will uh, oversight all of that uh, to make sure we're comfortable that it's, uh, it's a credible and responsible strategy. And if we're convinced it is, we will hand you the money, which is the inducement to join. Um, but really, it was therefore devolving a lot of decision-making to the regions, uh, who knew a lot more about the complexity of those problems and the solutions that were most likely to work. We're facing uh, very serious problems, uh, environmental problems, at a number of levels. Uh, uh, we really need uh, strategies. Uh, we, we never know quite the best answer, uh, and we have to move by trial and error. But we have to think of solutions that are likely to build in resilience, uh, and law and regulation and governance uh, can be part of doing that.